Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Photo Brigade podcast. I am Robert Kaplan. And um, I have opposing counsel across from me, Mickey Osterreicher. How you doing, Mickey? I'm well. Thanks for having me. Mickey is the uh, general counsel for the National Press Photographers Association. Yeah. And I'm excited to have you back. This is your third time on the podcast. I think it is. I don't think anybody's been on the podcast wow. three times except for It's like for you. being on The Tonight Show. It you is. Know, now might... we've got our mugs. And this is the first time I've actually worn a suit for a podcast, yes. so I, I feel really like, you know, we're, we're moving on. We're getting, we're getting better every, every time. Um, well, so I wanted to have you on again because we're always, as photographers in our industry, having issues with First Amendment rights. There's, uh, we've got drones are a big new uh, thing that photographers are using, um, and we're coming all under all sorts of scrutiny from the government and, uh, and whatnot for the usage of those drones. Um, there's also awful contracts being put out by, for instance, Time Incorporated, which we had a panel here recently. Right. Um, what else? Uh, and and also the right to privacy issues, which is are all of these things that we're going to talk about in this episode. Um, but before we do, I just want to say thank you to Adorama for letting us use their event space, as always. Adorama.com slash events to see all that they do. Um, also, please check out photobrigade.com slash live. Click the subscribe button to our YouTube page. That would be awesome if you did that. We're putting out podcasts, events, panels. We're going to be putting out a new show soon, which you're going to hear about hopefully soon. Um, and uh, thank you to Canon Professional Services uh, for your support, as well as Temba Bags. So with no further ado, I uh, we should move on to advocacy. Yeah. So, Mickey, I, I want to show everybody that... Although you're a, <laughs> like a man in a suit now. Exactly. You I clean be, up well, you too. You clean up well, too. And age. <laughs> Back in the day. Oh, I guess that didn't work well. There we go. Back in the day, you shot stills. I did. And you shot video. I, I, I did. You were a TV, a TV journalist for most of your career, No. M well, yeah, towards the end. Um, I, I started out as a still photographer. I was the photo editor of the school paper at, yeah. at the University of Buffalo. There's my little T-shirt. And uh, <laughs> that's actually taken at the end of the uh, runway at the Buffalo International Airport. Very and that nice. is an Eastern Airline jet. For Eastern the, Airline. For the, those of you who might be old enough to remember Eastern <laughs> Airline. Not I. And it's probably only about... Oh, 10 feet over my head. And the fact oh, wow. that they actually let us uh, get out there and shoot stills for probably about two hours uh, was just something that would never happen today. Those were, those were different different days back then. Yeah. Um, and then also, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to redo this. It's okay. Um, then we got this nice shot of you. Yeah. You had this amazing afro going I, on. I did. And it was red, too. And it was red. You now see? I'm just glad I have hair. <laughs> now you're just glad you have hair. You see, I'm starting to get the receding hairline myself. And, uh, you know. So um, you were, you were. is this back in your college days? Or is it this was, your... yeah. That and was... so is that when you started shooting? It, it was, yeah. Uh, and uh, I went to UB, the University of Buffalo, when uh -huh. I was when I was 16 and, and started uh, shooting pretty much right right after I got there. Yeah. Uh, so a Pentax actually was my first camera. I, oh, this, yeah. is, this is a big deal for me to now have a, an Icon FTN. Nice, so, nice. Those are durable, you know, pieces of equipment. Back uh, in the day, they made them real durable. They, they did, uh, but everything was manual back then. There's yeah. no autofocus, no auto exposure. I right. mean, you know, you were glad that there was a little placeholder in the back to put the... Uh, uh, the the end of the film box in so you could remember which camera had color which camera had black and white <laughs> wow man those things I take for granted these days you know um, this next photo uh, just to kind of give an idea of what you're doing these days you you are representing uh, you're the general counsel for the National Press Photographers Association you go around the country to advocate for photographers and can you talk about why you were at the uh, White House with Jay Carney yeah so we uh uh, the, the White House Correspondents Association, the NPPA, the White House News Photographers Association, and a bunch of other uh, associations uh, really were taking some issue in it with, the, with the president uh, and the administration when they were talking about them being the most transparent uh, administration to date. And we were just finding that 
at least visually, the access to the president wasn't what we wanted, uh, it, uh, not only in the visual sense, but also for uh, reporters to report on things. So uh, we sent a letter, I helped draft a, a letter uh, that went to uh, then Press Secretary Carney, and we had a meeting. Uh, we've tried to continue to improve things. Uh, it's just one of the many issues that, that we deal with, you know, and from my perspective, uh, having been a photojournalist for 40 years, I just see photographers being squeezed on all sides, from the access issues to copyright and contract, uh -huh. uh, photographers who many of the NPPA photographers used to be um, work for newspapers and, and, uh, and television stations on staff. Those jobs are going away, and so now uh, the copyright becomes a problem as people go online and try and create a presence uh, and show off their work, and other people just think that the Internet is the public domain. Right. The public domain is a, a legal term of art, and it basically means something is outside of copyright. Uh, unfortunately, too many people think the Internet is just and anything is there for the taking. And when photographers try to educate people and let them know, no, you can't just take my picture, there is what I see is this mob mentality of entitlement of like, how dare you tell us we can have right. your work? Right. Yet, you know, the music industry has done a really good job. I mean, think about... Uh, years ago when there was all the streaming and music industry went out of their way to say, would you walk into a record store, of course they don't exist anymore, <laughs> and, and, and take a vinyl album or steal a CD? That would be stealing. Well, you know, taking music that doesn't belong to you, that you haven't paid for, is the same thing now as taking images that don't belong to you. I mean, it's, it's uh, right-click gone wild. You know, right-click, save as, all of a sudden, right. that picture you think is yours to do whatever you want with. And unfortunately, you know, photographers trying to earn a living off that picture, it's very difficult when it's out there for free. Right. So, I mean, every day I deal with one issue or another, or sometimes multiple issues a day. Uh -huh. So so let's go back to the uh, White House situation. Um, now, I believe that at that time, what what the main issue was is that, you know, one of my friends, you know, uh, Pete Souza, is the president's photographer. He's taking all these photos. Wonderful former journalist. But right now, what he's doing is it's not journalism. It's, I guess, propaganda, right? I, I, well, I, mean, I don't, I don't know, know what he, I mean, he's documenting the president. Sure. Every president has had a photographer. I've had many conversations about this yeah. issue with Pete. It's not about Pete. Sure, no, it's not uh, about Pete. You know, I, I mean, every photographer wants access. Sometimes the difference between, you know, getting a great picture, not getting a great picture is the access that you have. Yeah. And certainly the presidency needs to be documented. The problem we would find is that it's one thing to document for history, and it's another thing when we would see uh, certain uh, things on the daily schedule that would say closed press. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then moments later, images from that closed press event would be pushed out on Flickr or on whitehouse.gov or whatever. And Edited by the government. You know, right. So as I've tried to explain to other attorneys that represent other news organizations, if somebody handed you a story that was written by the White House, would you just take it and reprint it right, without yeah. fact checking, without looking into it, without asking questions? Right. And so our position was, you know, that's all well and good, but we really should have an independent press sure. covering the president as well. Absolutely. One of one of the things that I, I, I believe the argument was is we're in a time of change you know we have social media now we're you know the president's photographer can take a picture and it immediately goes out to you know the press and millions of people um, do you, I mean obviously that is one of the issues that's creating this problem but I mean do you I mean I, there's really just no excuse to, well, to it's, not have it's just you know the the thing is nowadays that the people that create content now have the ability to control content uh, think about the NFL. Uh -huh. You know, before they would have to sell the rights, the television rights, and one of the networks would broadcast the games. Now there's NFL.com. Uh -huh. Think about, um, you know, uh, entertainers and performances. Before, if they wanted coverage of their concerts, they would have to let journalists in, whether it was to shoot, you know, only the first few songs or the, th the first 30 seconds of a song or whatever. Now, you know, Beyonce, that was an issue we addressed. She basically was 
not allowing the press and was only pushing out uh, images that her own photographers took. We're seeing other contracts that talk about what the rights would be that photographers would have to give up in order to get the access to that. So more and more we're seeing people trying to control their own content. The problem with that for the American public is that if something bad happens, for example, if Michael Jackson, when he were alive, collapsed on the stage and the only people that were there were his own people, do you think we'd ever see any images from there? Right. If it comes down to, in sports, a player gets hurt or there's a really bad fight and there's no outside independent press but only whoever that entity controls the images. Do right. you think we'll ever get to see those images? Right. And, you know, it's kind of that creep where... It's the public has a right to know about these yeah. things. It's journalists that provide uh, those images and those stories. And that's why the First Amendment is something that is so important because little by little, those rights will be eroded and we won't be a country that can pride itself on the First Amendment. Right. Um, one of the things that you that you mentioned uh, when we were just uh, chatting there was about Taylor Swift's contract. So since you mentioned that, let's go ahead and jump into a little bit of that. Um, now, so Taylor Swift, uh, I remember the Foo Fighters, um, generally almost all of the, the bands. I've, I've had instances where I've, you know, I was fo photographing probably for the New York Times. I, I had the ability at that point to say no to these contracts because right. I was with the New York Times and that had some sort of, you know, power for them. But smaller papers they, they make you sign away not only your rights but the ability to do to just do anything with them they have to approve things you know and all that that's and, and a lot of uh, papers and photographers now are also uh, you know just saying no and walking away from them now there's been there has been I think that it was addressed after we made a big brouhaha over it Taylor Swift, did she change it? Uh, yeah, happened? so uh, one of our uh, members uh, sent me what was a proposed credentialing agreement between whoever the photographer would be and Taylor Swift uh, and her production team as to what uh, the, his, his or her access allowance would be in exchange for. Right. And some of those terms, even though you could keep copyright, uh, pretty much the license that you were granting to, to, to Taylor Swift was pretty widespread so that you pretty much lose control over the pictures. There was this uh, crazy clause that said that her people had a right to look at your camera and then delete images and seize your... I mean, it was just Wasn't really... was something that they could even it, destroy it, your camera? Yeah, it was, it was kind of... It was really... And, and the, I, I guess the fact that initially it was so off the wall that it made it easier and I, and I kind of reached out and contacted... Uh, her people, and they were very amenable. I mean, we had this the negotiation back and forth during the summer. Did we get everything we wanted? No. Did they concede quite a bit? Yes. And so, is it the best uh, photo agreement I've ever seen? No, but it certainly was a, a, a much bigger improvement over where we started from. How important is it when a photographer, no matter who they work for, um, sees a contract like this, that they turn it down because I, I can also imagine I remember when I first started shooting concerts back when I was in high school I think I was able to get credentials to the local paper you know and it was just fun for me for the most part you know I don't I don't think that I signed anything at that point but it's a real disservice to our industry as a whole when anybody signs something like that correct well you know that's a problem and uh, as Ben Benjamin Franklin said a long time ago we can all hang together or we can all hang separately and the problem is there's far too many people who don't think about the bigger picture and the fact that maybe a students they don't have to support a family uh, maybe their rent is being paid for they're, they have a scholarship or whatever. maybe they're not a full-time photographer right but yeah. but there are so many people now that are just happy to take pictures and give them away for free Free, there's also too many people that don't understand exactly what rights it's it's almost like so you go online now and it says terms of service or agreement you know and before you can get on the website um, you have to click I agree everybody clicks I agree do they read what they're right. agreeing to right. no and it's the same thing here in a written contract you know it's two minutes before you're supposed to be taken out to go and photograph from the pit or wherever you're going to be, it's like, here, I need you to sign this. Okay, so they're signing it. I mean, when you were working for the Times, 
not only didn't you want to sign it, but the Times wouldn't have wanted right. you to they sign it because as an employee, you're now giving away their rights. Because right. when you were shooting, the copyright to those images vested with them. Right. So people need to really be aware of what it is that they're agreeing to. Uh, and that's so important in anything. I mean, would you buy a car without knowing what the terms were in terms of how long you were going to have to pay and how much you were going to have to pay a mm -hmm. month? Certainly not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, especially with social media and when you're posting and doing things, you really need to be aware of, of what's going on in terms of service. And that's where, you know, NPPA and other photo associations come in in terms of educating people, being there to help. As I said, when this member called about this agreement, I mean, had he tried to pursue it himself, I doubt he would have gotten anywhere. Now, that's not to say that we work magic. I tried to negotiate with the Foo Fighters, and they, they weren't interested. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Janet Jackson as well. I, we, we had a conversation for a little bit, but they pretty much look like it's take it or leave it. The, they've gotten to the point that they don't feel that they need the media. Uh, to get their message out. And that's what we're seeing, as I said, um, in sports, in politics, in entertainment. That's all changing. Yeah. Um, so speaking of contracts, uh, about a month, not even a month ago, we had a panel where we're sitting right now. We had a, a handful of mainly Sports Illustrated uh, former staff photographers or, or some contributors. Some were from Time, actually. Some were from David, David Burnett, Burnett in particular. In. Yeah, in particular. So, um, and that's a, a big new issue that's going on. And your name was invoked a number of times by uh, our, our moderator, Alan Murabayashi. Um, and it's around the new contract that Time gave to their contributors. Right. Can you talk a, a little bit about what happened and and why it's so bad? Well, there were a number of people that took a look at the terms of those contracts and uh, really analyzed them. I took a look at them. You know, the one thing that really struck me just from the get-go was when I shot for Time Magazine, the day rate was the day rate. The day rate now is up to $650 oh, a day, yeah, up yeah. to. But the up to, you know, I mean, you see those so kinds big. of things yeah. in advertising when, <laughs> right, you know, yeah. as low as, as, low as you know, right. but as low as it never gets to that low. And what I was afraid of is that there were all these other conditions and it, this day rate might not get as high as yeah. the 650 So those were all the things um, I drafted a, a, a letter, an open letter, ASM. Uh, joined in that uh, and uh, and we sent it you know the time saying we would like to talk to you about these things again uh, I heard back almost immediately because I sent it to their attorney uh, and then pretty much all the discussion was cut off so at as as you saw in the discussion with all the other photographers if everybody you know on their own takes a look at the contract and decides those terms aren't good for me uh, Eventually, that's the only thing that's going to bring about some change. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think in the Taylor Swift thing, it was the publicity that that whole controversy around the agreement drew. I think if nobody had written about it, and that's there what it takes. Stories. It's bad and press for them it, to actually it, well, do something. It's not only bad press, but in this case, it's them not having enough photographers of the caliber that they want. Oh, interesting. Agreeing yeah. to their terms, and then they'll change them. But... If everybody's saying, yeah, what do I care, and they go ahead, well, then unfortunately that at, at some point may undermine um, the whole industry, just as we've seen things change with stock photography and how the prices for that right. have just been totally depressed. Right. Uh, you know, another thing that we've been talking about is the whole uh, Corbis uh, Getty VCG sale, you know, of, of, um, to, to the Chinese group. Again, there are people that were out shooting, um, working for them. They still don't know, you know, the images they see being used, but they're not getting paid. Uh, they don't know how they'll get paid. They don't know how that's all changed now as everybody takes their little piece out of a very shrinking pie. Yeah. How much, you know, it's going to be to the point that do I really think I can earn a living doing this? And these are all the kinds of things that it's so important to have an organization that can advocate uh, on their behalf. And yet, we all, I've also seen a lot of apathy on the part of photographers. Oh, I can't afford to join NPPA. So and to this me, is a great it's, segue, yeah. To me, it's you can't afford not, not yeah, to belong yeah. because unless we can speak as the voice of visual journalists, as a collective voice, 
uh, you're not going to do as well on your own. Right. So um, let's talk a little bit more about NPPA so that everyone is aware. Um, NPPA.org is right. the website where you can go and check it out. Uh, we've got um, one of the things. So this is a Press Photographers Association, journalists for the most part. Right. And so you guys have a code of ethics here. We do. Um, tell me about the code of ethics a bit. Well, you know, it's it's we've been around since 1946. So this is our 70th year. It's not like uh, we just popped up yesterday. The code of ethics has been cited many, many times. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the things that I've been dealing with, and we'll get to this in a second, is drones. And there's two issues with drones. There's the safety and there's the privacy issue. And the NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Agency, was tasked by the president a year ago to deal with privacy issues. Yeah. And so I'm one of the stakeholders. I've been at all the meetings. But at the outset, they're trying to develop best practices regarding they use the code of ethics from NPPA, from SPJ, from other organizations as kind of a model yeah. and a jumping off point. And they're really kind of, you know, pretty common sense things in terms of not manipulating images, mm -hmm. being truthful storytellers. I mean, there's nothing in there that would come as a surprise to anyone in terms of, you know, what... Uh, what's in there, and really, in terms of a requirement of being an NPPA member, aside from paying your dues, that's the only thing that we really ask is that you will abide by mm -hmm. these code of ethics. Um, so, on top of, so you guys just recently had a new election. You've got uh, a new president, uh, Melissa Little, right? Um, as a, a number of different board members as well. So there's a constant sort of transition of of you know folks in our industry that sort of head up this. Uh, organization. Exactly. And you, I mean, you've been with, how, how long have you well, been there? I've been a member of NPPA since 1973. And I still pay my dues, even though as their attorney, I, I don't have to. But I'm proud to be a member. And that's the whole thing is another, another thing that goes on is, well, what can NPPA do for me? And I'm just always reminded of, you know, President Kennedy's ask not what you can do for your country, but, what, you know, your, your country can do for you, right. but what you can do for your country. Right. And I, I think as an organization, I would like to see people join that say, what can I do for NPPA? What can I do to make our profession a better one? And, uh, and, I, and I think that's crucial if we're going to see organizations like ours uh, continue on into the future. And I think as we're facing the kind of economy we've been facing, as we're facing the kind of layoffs that we've seen and changes in the industry and copyright law, you know, one of the things that we advocated for um, is, sm is a small claims court because yeah. in order to bring a copyrights claim, it takes a tremendous amount of money and most of the infringements that at least I see are not worth a whole lot and photographers don't want a whole lot right but the only place since copyright law is federal law the only place you can go is federal court uh, we wrote in support of it years ago the copy the United States Copyright Office came out in support of it in 2013 um, there's a number of people in Congress that are now working on trying to make that a reality and all of the photo associations have joined together now in figuring out a way to make that happen so that uh, our members, uh, people that make their living from visual images, and not just photography, but artists and graphic designers and people like that whose work is also misappropriated, uh, can have a place that they can go and, and hopefully get some compensation for the work that's being taken. That would be, that would be really amazing. I mean, j just that alone. Um, I mean, is there, was there something, I remember, so there's the small claims, but were you working with the Copyright Office in some sort of capacity to make registration of images easier in we're a way? We're still working with them. I mean, we're still, there's the, the published versus unpublished. I, I mean, yeah. that's been a point of contention, and we hope to address that as well, but we continue that dialogue with them. But right now, the main focus, since we've got members of Congress interested, is on getting a small claims tribunal put in place that will be able to, you know, be something that's workable. Right. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I know from experience, it's just uh, it's difficult. And then plus all of the rules and, and there's there's so many ways that they can try to get you based off of how you registered those, who you shot them for, you know, and it just. But the Copyright Office is really helpful. And if you go online, um, 
if you can't get your uh, question answered online, call them. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had to do that on a yep. couple of occasions, and they're really responsive. And uh, they really do have a place in their hearts for the small creator. They understand, and we've made it very clear, and, and, and I think, you know, advocated for our position in that they do understand how difficult it is. And I think, you know, people shouldn't think about copyright infringement these days as the music industry or the move motion picture industry where they're talking about big numbers. I mean, most of the infringements that happen are literally on a day-to-day -day basis. And why not? When, you know, the last time I looked at the numbers, which was probably uh, a few years ago, there were 450 million images being uploaded to Facebook every day. That's crazy. And that's just Facebook. That is crazy. So with that many images out there, think about the possibilities. And, you know, there's the DMCA takedown where you can file. You don't get paid, but at least the image comes down. But even those things are now starting to get nuanced in terms of fair use. Um, it's, I mean, it's like, don't get me started on that. Yeah. In terms of fair use, is supposed to be a defense to copyright infringement. It's supposed to be an exception to copyright law. Fortunately, what we've seen happening is that copyright law is now becoming an exception to fair use. And that's, that's really unfortunate. Yeah. Um, so before we uh, get rid of, the, I just want to show a couple of the different things that if you go to MPPA.org, you can find out all of the different uh, resources they, they offer. You have training, you have the Northern Short courses. Which is have, coming up next is, weekend. Yeah, it's coming up next New weekend. Jersey. So all sorts of workshops and whatnot, online education. Um, so there's, there's just a lot of resources. Yeah, there's an immersion course that's coming up in May up in Syracuse University that's uh, pretty much uh, targeted at still photographers that are trying to learn how to do multimedia, how to do video, how to transition. Because more and more people are, are, are not just asking for stills anymore. Oh, they yeah. want a complete package. So we've been doing training on that as well. There's just so much more. Even, even in my you know, relatively short career um, compared to the likes of the many people that are involved in the MPPA, I mean, things have changed. I mean, you, not only do you need to be a, it used to be that you would ship your, you just ship your film in, right? Oh, you're sure. pretty much done. Sure. Someone else edits and deals with that stuff. Now you're your own editor, you're on your own toner, you're, you know, you have to write up all the captions. And then now, now when folks are having to shoot video, they have to edit their video, create the packages. Right. And, and they have to learn consuming. about sound. They have to learn oh, about sound. a lot of yeah. other things. I know when I transitioned Back in 1982, when my paper went out of business and I, I went to the television side, I mean, just simple things like letting things come in and out of frame when you're shooting video. Mm -hmm. You'd never think of doing that when you're shooting stills. You let it go out of frame, there's no picture anymore. Right, exactly. But in, in order to create those transitions, um, you know, those are things to think about. I mean, the other thing that I always laugh about is, so for so many years I shot stills looking through an SLR, seeing things in color, pre-visualizing what they'd look like in black and white because of the paper that's pretty much all we ran right when i went to tv i was looking through a black and white viewfinder back then uh -huh. and pre-visualizing what they would look like in color because that's what we were broadcasting yeah. in so there's all these things that you know people uh take for granted but you need to kind of know about and learn about and 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 get really good at right because it's really competitive it out is there. it really is out there uh, very competitive um, so we mentioned drones before. I want to kind of get into the world of droning. The, this is such a, a sort of new phenomenon because drones are just available to anybody. I went to a Photo Plus Expo uh -huh. recently, and the entire, it, like, the whole back was covered in nets, and they just had drones flying everywhere. So, so tell me about the world of droning and what you're doing uh, to, to help out because it's a new way to tell stories. So obviously there's a lot of different uses for drones. Amazon wants to use them to, to, to deliver packages. Mm -hmm. Obviously from my point of view, we want to use them for news gathering. I see drones as just another tool. It's like going on assignment and deciding, do I want to shoot this with a wide angle? Do I want to shoot it with a telephoto? What do I want to use? What's the best way for me to tell the story at hand? Uh, one of the things that I'm constantly talking about is think about when there's a catastrophe, there's a hurricane, an earthquake, something really bad happens. What's the first thing that happens? President, the governor, somebody in office some government official usually gets there and takes to the air so that they can get a better overview of what just happened. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, using a drone is a way to, to do that safely. I mean, obviously, 
TV helicopters, news helicopters, we've been flying for a long time, but we've seen some tragic accidents. Yep. Um, aside from the fact that not everybody can afford to have a Bell Jet Ranger at their disposal. Uh-huh. The second part is, does it make more sense even for the news organizations that have it? Let's just say out in California and TV stations, could they fly the Bell Jet Ranger out to a forest fire 50, 60, 70 miles away to shoot you know, 30 seconds of aerial footage that they're gonna use on the nightly news? Or does it make more sense to have a crew that's gone out there to cover the story on the ground put a drone up for a minute or two and get that same 30 seconds of footage and then just bring it back down again. I mean, economically, safety-wise, there's just so many positive uses uh, for drones. But unfortunately, you know, what we've seen from the the FAA is that uh, back in 2012, Congress mandated that they safely incorporate UAS, unmanned aerial systems, Uh into the national airspace. Uh, and they do it by September 15th, uh, S- September 30th, 2015. Well, we're already uh, almost three months into 2016. It was just a year ago um, uh, this, this month that they issued the notice of proposed rulemaking. They've gotten all kinds of comments on it, but they still haven't come up with a final rule. Uh-huh. So that becomes a problem because the reason people depend on regulation is so they can have some certainty. Uh, You want to know what the law is. And the problem is that the FAA is saying, don't do this, don't do that. But they're not saying, but here's what we've decided you can do. And so there's a free-for-all going on out there of people using them, some people acting carelessly, recklessly. The the main problem are the numb nuts like this guy. Exactly. And so when I testified in front of the California legislature uh, last summer, you know, one of the things that I said and I constantly keep saying is, you can't fix stupid. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, you can come up with all the laws you want. I mean, people drive without automobile insurance, without inspections, without driver's licenses, but we don't say people can't drive anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, same thing here with, with drones. I mean, the one example that you've got up is so this guy flies his drone crashes into the Empire State Building, the drone falls and it's somewhere like on the 38th floor on a parapet, he walks in and asks security, hey, can I get my drone back? And they said, sure, wait right here, and then he gets arrested. You know, we've seen the the one story about the guy who was drunk, who flew his drone, landed on the White House lawn. Unfortunately, you know, the news uh, does itself a disservice on reporting on all of these crazy things rather than maybe some of the good uses that drones are put to. But... uh, This isn't the first time we've had to deal with this kind of public hysteria. You know, back in the late 1800s when George Eastman invented the brownie, it was the first time that anybody could take uh, a camera out on the street. And people were talking about, oh, my God, the right to privacy as we know it is over. There were signs up on beaches saying no uh, photography. Uh, And yet, you know, late 1800s, people wore more to the beach than they wear to church now, but they were still worried about that. Right. And eventually, you know, Louis Brandeis, when he was a Harvard Law student, went on to become a Supreme Court justice, wrote the right to privacy, which kind of started privacy laws. And eventually the law started to catch up with technology. The problem nowadays is that technology is going at this exponential rate. And the law and bureaucracy is going at this glacial rate and the divide keeps getting bigger. But eventually, I think we'll see, you know, some balance. But in the meantime, we've got to deal with all these issues. Right. Uh, So they just they um, uh, one of the uh, congressmen just proposed what's called a micro uh, UAS, micro drone rule. Right. And and basically what that is, is any drone that's under four point four pounds is operated below 400 feet within line of sight Mm -hmm. during daylight hours and not closer than five miles to an airport unless you get permission. Easy to remember rules. Sure. And then other than registering the drone, though, you know, and fly safely and not recklessly, those are pretty much the rules. And I think that that, that that amendment was just adopted into the FAA's Reauthorization Act, which is, was passed uh, by the Transportation Committee 
and we'll see if the regular House passes it, and then it's got to go to the Senate. But. So, so wasn't there a deadline just recently uh, about you had to have your drones registered just yes, recently? Yes, it just passed. Uh, I think the 19th was the last and day. And so what was the, what's the deal with that? Well, the I, I remember there was is, a lot of problems you know, with I, yeah. I've written about the fact that there's a lot of unintended consequences uh -huh. about that. And the fact is that if you don't have your drone registration papers and a police officer comes up to you while you're flying your drone and you can't produce them, you can be subject to fines, civil fines, uh, up to $27,000 oh and gosh. and criminal fines up to $250,000. So, you know, it's something like that that people, you know, yeah, get, the, get them registered, but we really haven't yet seen that nexus between registration and safety. I mean, right. just because it's registered doesn't mean that somebody's going to operate in a safe manner. But, you know, we'll give them that. People, you know, if they want to, can register to their drones. But we need a lot more than that going forward. Wasn't there something else that uh, someone, I, uh, basically, that this registry would be public? Yeah, that that's another issue. And actually, there's two, two lawsuits going on because uh, when at the FAA was saying everybody has to register, that means minors uh, and what you have to do is give them your name and your address and eventually that's going to be in a database that will be discoverable right uh, and people can then find out you know who owns a drone and where do they live where they and, live and, and likely, maybe yeah. looking for other things other than who owns a drone and well, most and, likely someone that owns a drone owns a lot of camera gear uh, it you know any of those things are possibilities so you know, again, those are all the kinds of things that get to swirl around my head and why I have to replace the little sign on my desk that says bang head here, <laughs> usually, you know, a couple times a week. Because <laughs> you've made a hole in your desk, right? Um, okay, so uh, another thing was uh, recently, was it in Jersey, the, the right to privacy? or um... Yeah, so there's a couple of bills that have come up. You know, we're seeing them all around the country, but since we're in New York, we'll, 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 right, we'll, sure. we'll use the state right across <laughs> the river. And uh, so there's another bill that uh, was proposed by one of their legislatures that says you can't photograph a minor uh, uh, unless you have the permission of the minor's parent. And that kind of creates all kinds of, again, new rights of privacy. When you're out in public, the general rule is there's no reasonable expectation of privacy. It's why when we walk down the street, there are video surveillance cameras and we're photographed and recorded hundreds of times a day. Yep. If you're in your house, that's the place that you have the greatest expectation of privacy. And we've seen that uh, legislators are trying to change that in terms of, um, again, in New Jersey, they had this critical infrastructure bill. I mean, we've seen them in a lot of other states. They almost cut and paste the same language. And they say you can't get f closer than 500 feet to critical infrastructure, which could be bridges, roads, tunnels, hospitals. Pretty much there's probably nothing that would really not be considered critical infrastructure. Our position is if you can get that close to them on the ground and photograph and record them, then there shouldn't be a technology-specific rule saying just because the camera is now somewhere in the air that you can't do that that, right. that either. Especially when in sometimes it would make more sense to use a drone than a manned aircraft or then approaching on foot if you've got you know, a, a chemical spill, if you've got an intense forest fire. It would be better to lose a drone there and not endanger humans. But these are, again, all the kinds of things we need to uh, to to look at and and deal with. But there is a negotiation. There is a, a re there is you know a reasonable expectation of doing things safely. You know there needs to be Absolutely. something in between and what that guy did running his, you know landing his uh, drone in the White House lawn or the Empire State Building, and then doing it responsibly. Of right. course. And the NPPA is part of a news media coalition, uh, and we've been working together with the FAA, meeting with them. We're actually doing testing down at the Mid Atlantic test site. Uh, there's six sites around the country that the FAA set up to do testing where we're teaching people how to fly safely uh, and also trying to envision situations that there might be. Like, for example, big news story, all the satellite trucks show up. Mm -hmm. They're all in one area and they're putting up a tremendous amount of microwave energy. We have no idea if a drone flies through those beams 
what it's going to do to the communications because there's a lot of powerful energy there. Mm -hmm. We've offered to do the testing to see what happens. Uh, so we don't have to find out that one flies through and all of a sudden you know, it falls out of yeah. the sky. Mm -hmm. So, again, these are all the things that um, we, on behalf of visual journalists, have been advocating for. Okay. Uh, let's uh, switch topics a little bit. Last time you were on, we talked about, I believe it was uh, Robert Sklerik yeah. and his uh, infamous uh, arrest, right? Uh, he was covering uh, Occupy or, or some, something like that. Uh, he was actually co covering uh, Stop and Frisk. Stop and Frisk. That's Up in the Bronx. Is. Up in the Bronx. And he was arrested by a... New York City New police. York City police officer who claimed that he was using his flash to blind him. Well, originally he was just arrested uh, and uh, charged with obstruction of governmental administration. Uh, they took his cameras. They took his credentials. Uh, this was just uh, this was in 2012, just before the uh, Republican convention in Tampa, uh -huh. and uh, so uh, one of the attorneys for the New York Times and I worked at getting his uh, cameras back and then his credentials, uh, and then eventually had the charges dismissed. Uh -huh. uh, what happened then while we were working on that is it, it, in a subsequent misdemeanor complaint that the officer swore out, he basically said the reason I arrested him was because he was firing his flash off in my eyes. All right, yeah. Uh, there were three small problems with that, first being when they arrested him and inventoried his gear, his personal property. There was no flash in the inventory. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one was when uh, Robert went to IAB, Internal Affairs in New York, and made a complaint about what had happened. He gave them the 56 images he had shot at night. And if you look at the metadata, you know there's a field that says the fa flash yeah. exposure. And they, every field said no flash. And the third part was he didn't own a flash. Right. Well, aside from getting the charges dismissed, the uh, district attorney in the Bronx was not too happy about all this and ended up uh, convening a grand jury and indicting the officer for a, a number of things, but, but basically it came to filing a false instrument. Because on the complaint when an officer signs it, it says under, under perjury, penalty of yeah. per perjury. Uh, eventually, uh, this went to trial not that long ago, a few right. months ago. Officer was convicted ended up with I, somewhere, I think it was 100 hours of community service. But mm -hmm. the point is, it was the first time we'd ever seen something like that. Go that far, uh, yeah. Go, go that far. But unfortunately, I deal with that around the country almost on a daily basis where photographers are either interfered with, harassed, or arrested for doing nothing more than taking pictures or recording video. And just yesterday, we became aware of a case in Philadelphia uh, where uh, the judge, a federal judge in that case, uh, found that the, the right to record was not clearly established, at least in that part of the Eastern District of, of, of Pennsylvania. So where we're starting to see a lot of U.S. Circuit Courts say the right is clearly established, this is kind of an outlier, and we're really hoping that up, up on appeal it gets reversed. Seems like you've got a lot on your plate. Uh, yes, my plate runneth over. But, you know, I love I love what I do. For me, it's a way of giving back uh, to a profession that I love. And, you know, I mean, for the most part, uh, as a photojournalist, I felt like I never worked a day in my life. Now, mm -hmm. there's some people I work with that might, <laughs> might say that. But, no, really, it's like you're paying me to go out on these stories that I, you know, I was always curious Love working with my hands, love seeing with my eye. It was just like, it didn't seem like work to me. Right. And so it's, to me, it's so important to now represent uh, so many others who are now finding it much more difficult to earn a living with all of the things that we've talked about going on. Uh, and, and if I can do something for them and, if, and, and help NPPA do something for them, then, you know, it's, it's a really nice way of giving back. I think that that's uh, really important, and, and it really shows why you should join an organization like, MP, if not NPPA, uh, another organization a like absolutely. it that, that uh, advocates for, for us as in our profession. You know, it's, uh, you know, I take calls from people all the time. Uh, sometimes they'll say, no, I'm not a member, and I'll I have to say, you know, it's really not fair for me to give you some advice or point you in the right direction. And then they'll call back, you know, 10 minutes later. Okay, I joined. Exactly. But, you know, you really shouldn't yeah. wait till then. You shouldn't <laughs> join because I need it now. Right. I mean, because we're doing things on an ongoing basis. And 
just kind of riding on the coattails of those who support the organization really isn't isn't fair. We should also mention that you do get some things out of oh, it as absolutely. well, like a like a monthly subscription to News Photographer magazine, which is always fun to read. Yeah, it's you know. like Life magazine. It, it, you know, it's. It, it's something that is not available out there. You have the opportunity to enter both uh, still clip contest and TV contest. Uh, we're going to be posting more of those results online, so it's uh, obviously hard to show the winners of the video contest in the uh, magazine. In the magazine right, yeah. But we we will be having those That's online exciting. as well. You know, there's there's so many again educational opportunities, mentoring. Uh, you know, David Burnett uh, is is great. He's been a member forever. Uh, just going back to the program that you had. I mean, all of those guys could have cut their own deals, thinking back, you know. And, but but they all basically are standing up for the greater good. Yep. And that's what we're trying to do at NPPA as well. That's that's perfect. So NPPA.org, please go. And if you are a visual journalist, um, photographer, subscribe. I mean, join. Be a member. Um, uh, you know, one thing I... I, I I'm sure I asked you in the last one, but I'm kind of forgetting. How did you get into the law? Like, how did, how did you tran uh, turn from a photographer into a lawyer? So, uh, towards the end of my career, back in the 90s, well, it wasn't the end then, but uh, I had a reporter that I worked with, and we covered lots of stories together. We actually went around the world and then were uh, there when Terry Anderson, who's the oh, AP yeah, yeah. correspondent, got released. And we worked together a lot. And one day he got in the car and said, I'm thinking of going to law school. Mm -hmm. And I said, I always thought about going to law school. So we ended up going to law school during the day and working the 2.30 to 11.30 shift. And, you know, kind of the rest is history. I went to high school with Terry Anderson's daughter. He, he, they ended up moving to Athens, Ohio, where I'm from. Yeah. Interesting. And he ran for office, didn't win, though. Um, that's the last time I heard about him. So anyhow, um, so that's great. Um, now, is there anything that we haven't really discussed that we wanted to, to get out there to the our Probably, fine viewers? Probably, but, you know, until somebody refreshes <laughs> my recollection, I know, it's I like, know. oh, yeah, I meant to talk about that. So, Well, if, if any of you are, are curious to, to learn more, you know, Mickey's just an email away. Exactly. Um, he won't talk to you unless you, <laughs> you can become a member. Uh, no, he will. He's I a will good talk guy. To people, He's a good you guy. Know, and, and I, that's the other thing is I post a lot of stuff on both the NPPA Facebook page yep. and, and Twitter. Um, and it's when I say I post a lot of stuff, it's things that are of interest yep. uh, to journalists. Even if you're not a member. It's, Even it's, if, if you're not a member. So you can follow uh, M Mickey is NPPA lawyer, yes. at NPPA lawyer yeah. on Twitter. Right. Um, and then NPPA is uh, their handles. Do you know? So my email is lawyer at NPPA.org. There you go. And so you pretty much uh, one of those two ways you can find me. And you can subscribe. You can subscribe on uh, Facebook, a National Press Photographers Association. They have their own page where they uh, regularly post interesting content. Um, and I'm really, again, looking forward to seeing what this new group of, of folks that are, have just kind of gotten on board uh, do, because yeah. I know that they're really good people. And that's that's the other thing is we need young people. I mean, you know, I've been doing this a while. Uh, my hair isn't the afro. It's not <laughs> red anymore. And at some point, we need people that will. I don't want to be the old white guy. That uh, We need, you know, diversity. diversity. Yeah. We need young people. We need people that care about this profession. Otherwise, there just won't be an organization anymore, and everybody will be left to their own device. And it doesn't work that well when you're trying to represent yourself rather than having a group represent you. That's right. Well, Mickey, I, I really appreciate you coming. Oh, thank um, you for having this me. It's been, always a pleasure. This has been really great. Uh, thanks again to uh, Adorama for the use of their space. Thanks, Chewy, for, for switching for us. Um, thank you to Canon Professional Services, Temba Bags, and most importantly, to Mickey. You have a great thank one. Thank you. Thank and you. And everyone, we'll see you next time. Oh, that, did they, uh, oh, they oh wait, they, sorry. They, yeah, you can ask some questions. Oh, sorry, I didn't sorry. even realize. Sorry about that. We should ask some questions. Did we already stop recording? No? Okay. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. What's up? Okay. So I actually have two different questions, if that's okay. Uh, one is, uh, I'm a elected member of the Writers Guild of America East, which is the Writers Intelligence, and recently I took on the job freelancing for me as a photographer. I, I should know better by my age and stuff, I guess, but should I have a should so, so you want to so the, the the question was basically uh, you're you're a photographer you're wondering if you should have a specific contract for all the jobs that you take 
Um, absolutely. I mean, it's if you had entered into a writing assignment, did you have a contract? Yeah, so why, why, because they're pictures? You know, is, is it any different? It's basically, you know, the, the, the three principles of contracting. Uh, offer, consideration, acceptance. Uh, you know, I, I will offer you $100 to take a picture for me, okay? But there you go, offer, take a picture, the consideration's $100, will you do it? You know, and if you accept, great, you've got a contract. But if there's a dispute about it, Oh, no, 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 I told you $50. Well, you want that in writing, you know? Uh, and how many pictures? And okay, but how about if they decide not to pay the invoice? You know, I mean, there's, there's you, you should have an agreement in writing uh, for whatever you do. It's really important. There are many boilerplates there, out there. There are, but you really need to, to tailor it to what your needs are. You know, it's, it's tough using just boilerplate. They may not cover all the aspects. And, you know, quite frankly, when it doesn't happen that much with writers, where it, oh, yeah, I could write that story because for some reason writing is a different level of talent at least a lot of people think there is. But in terms of pictures, oh, I, I could take that picture. I mean, as opposed to hiring a professional photographer. It's the same thing with contracts. You, it, at some point, might want to consult with a lawyer, not a matrimonial attorney, not a real estate attorney, but an IP attorney. I mean, you want to talk to somebody that's familiar with the area that you're interested in to, to get advice. And, you know, it could be money well spent. I know everybody's trying to save money these days, which is why they don't hire photographers. They just take their own pictures. But as we've seen, you get what you pay for. So, and you had another question. Yeah, thank you. Um, the other one is that just for me, like as a street photographer, I will um, take photos of people always asking their permission if I might put it on line and I'd show them the photos right then and there if they don't like them, I might delete them. But I know because having worked before um, working with PBS, I worked at anything that was news and I always got releases. I should really have some kind of app or something where I get a release. You, you want so so the, the, the question was, she's a street photographer and she wants to know about releasing images, you know, taking pictures of people. Does she need to get releases for those images? So if you work for the news, the answer is no. And when news photographers shoot images that are for editorial use, they don't need model releases. That whole right to record in public, no reasonable expectation of privacy, that's a different right than using the images. So if you took an image and you used it in the newspaper, you know, then that's fine and you don't need a model release. Well, they might have had their own strict standards because they didn't want any problems. But if that image then got used on a box of Wheaties, and you didn't have a model release, that would be a real problem. And the, what's happening these days is so much of the databases that are being collected by editorial side end up bleeding over and somebody on the commercial side or advertise, oh, that's a great picture, and they use it for something that there's no release for and then everybody gets into trouble. So, you know, just because you've shown them the courtesy of, oh, I took your picture and if you don't like, whatever, that's all well and good, but when push comes to shove, if that image gets used and they're not happy about it, you and the people that published it and whoever else they can think of will probably be getting a uh, summons and complaint about the lawsuit that somebody's filing. Commercially. Commercially. Commercially, yeah. yeah. There again, are. And again, and they're stand those, those, the model releases are uh, more standard. Um, so uh, it, it, you don't have to really reinvent the wheel on, on that. There is an app for model releases. I think ASMP has an app specifically for that. ASMP, if you, if you just look it up in the iOS store. Um, also, if you, you know, with Photo Brigade and PPA, Photo Business Sense, there's a, a, a a group on Facebook called Photo Business Sense, uh, also the Photo Brigade Forum, and we're just a community. If you yeah. have these questions, you can ask, hey, does anybody yeah. use this type of uh, contract? Can you give me an example? Nobody's trying to hide the ball yeah. out there. So yeah. that's what we're all about, trying to help. So, yeah. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Any, any other, other questions any other before questions, we guys? wrap it up again? <laughs> All right. I guess we'll really end it. Okay, okay Mickey. Well, thanks again. Oh, thank you. And uh, we'll see you on the uh, podcast. Before next time. Okay.
Excellent.